All right, it is 1.30. Uh, we're going to start. Uh, I'm Lars Egger. This is uh, Taylor Lawrence. Um, we are your MCs for the session on applications doing DNS. Uh, barriers to responsibility. This is a non-working group forming Wolf, as far as I remember. Uh, we are super organized. We already have minute takers, which are Chris Wood and Paul Hoffman. Thank you very much. They're doing uh, minutes in the Etherpad, which is the Etherpad you would expect for this buff. If you want to help them out, um, when you you know, in case you get bored, you know, add names of people that you know, but they might not know the names of for the minutes and so on. So make sure we have a good record of all of this. Uh, Aaron Falk is Jabber scribing, which is mostly sort of relaying questions from the Jabber to the microphones. Um, so if, if Aaron uh, gets into line, uh, we, we might uh, give him priority if and when he wants to channel somebody who's been waiting a long time in Jabberland. Um, we have the possibility to take remote questions. Um, so we need to look at this thing to figure out whether somebody is getting into line remotely. If you notice us missing somebody who's been up there for a long time, signal us. Um, this is our agenda. It's pretty packed. Um, Tail's going to do a little background presentation. Um, and we have a few very short presentations on um, various possible uh, items of work in the overall space that the buff is supposed to talk about. And then we have a little bit of an open mic session mm -hmm. at the end. Uh, that is the plan. Would anybody like to bash this agenda? OK, that worked. Um, where is my node? Well, it's here. This is the ITF node. Well, it's unfortunately a little bit small, um, but you should have seen this already. Uh, rules apply when you participate here, both in terms of disclosing, uh, disclosing IPR uh, and in a code of conduct. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with these, you are highly encouraged to refer to respective RFCs, and you're expected to uh, comply with the requirements stated therein. Um, you, you, you do want to be aware of these rules before you make a contribution, and that is uh, speaking at this point, for example, or sending an email. Right. Uh, without further ado, tail. <laughs> there we go. It, it wasn't on before because that light definitely wasn't on. Um, so uh, even though an awful lot of you in the room are kind of familiar with how we got here, uh, we just want to do a really quick background to remind people of uh, it, very briefly the evolution of the DNS that has resulted in this. In particular, okay, I'll run it from here. Maybe. Okay, there's a magic that Miriam knew that I don't. Okay, but try not. Uh -huh. So um, going way back to the 80s, uh, with the very typical way that we did DNS on the internet was stub resolvers would talk to local, typically local recursive resolvers, uh, full service caching resolvers that then talk to the authoritative name servers for their data. Um, while it was always possible to uh, use a different model for getting your DNS data, this was the one that almost all of our, our clients were using on the internet. Um, it was using plain text UDP packets for questions and answers. And one really um, interesting thing about this is it made the DNS traffic susceptible to um, uh, being monitored. And so the Snowden revelations that happened um, half a dozen years ago now uh, led to the ITF's position paper, uh, essentially RFC 7258, that um, pervasive monitoring on the internet is, should be considered an attack on the infrastructure. And so at that point, there were a couple of uh, work products that came out of the IETF. One was uh, that the DeepRive working group was formed to try to address how we can improve the privacy of our DNS traffic on the internet. Um, one of their more notable work products was encrypting DNS traffic um, with the DNS over TLS protocol, which essentially just wrapped TLS around our standard um, DNS wire format messages. And then along came DNS over HTTPS which took uh, basically DNS over TLS one step further 
um, and not only encrypted the traffic, but then sent it over the same port that all the other HTTPS traffic was going over to make DNS traffic at that point indistinguishable from, uh, quote, normal HTTP traffic. Um, so RFC 8484 was uh, published uh, nine months or so ago. And so this is using HTTP primitives to do this, uh, this uh, query and response model. Uh, it really disrupted the traditional DNS model on uh, which a number of different services had been built. And now web servers were uh, really kind of in, uh, pretending to be the role of, or could be pretending uh, the role of a traditional resolving name server. And so there's been a lot of controversy and concerns over the deployment models. Uh, one is that with a lot of policy now being implemented in local DNS resolvers, it was really easy and possible to bypass that. Um, and not just the policy, but actually even just a matter of uh, things that you might not consider policy. Uh, for example, though, just an internal view of your namespace versus an external view of your namespace. Uh, some of these issues that come up uh, should presumably be in scope for the ITF. Others are uh, kind of really above all of our pay grade and maybe need to be considered elsewhere. Um, one of the th issues, a few of the issues that we're um, finding with Doe now is essentially this kind of long-term tension that our entire society <laughs> has had for millennia now, since human beings became intelligent, which is where is the, um, the balance that you find between uh, things like safety and security and privacy and convenience and ease of use, um, all of these things are in tension with each other and Doe has really uh, kind of amplified that in trying to increase privacy and security, for example, but at the detriment perhaps of some other aspects of security. And um, so there's a big question that goes on about filtering. Can we filter, you know, is the DNS a good place to filter traffic? You know, how, if we're going to achieve the privacy goal of Doe of not being able to let people's traffic get monitored, well, that also enhances the ability of people doing bad things to not get monitored. Um, and the network as a neutral computer just really can't tell the difference between, uh, too easily between what's good and what's evil. And um, so in this environment where traffic, DNS traffic is not being uh, able to be monitored, are, you know, are we able to somehow still find a, a good way of addressing this? Uh, it also should be noted that a lot of the services that have been built on the end also are in tension with the network's end-to-end -end principle uh, that we've uh, had where essentially the, the middle of the network was supposed to be relatively dumb compared to uh, the edges. Uh, there were uh, three internet drafts submitted originally and that we discussed in ITEP 104. Um, and these started looking at a bunch of these issues. Uh, it, be it wasn't entirely clear where to continue pursuing these drafts. As uh, most of you here know, uh, you know, we can either pursue drafts through uh, work product of working groups or we can do them on the independent submission track. And there's still a big question about what the appropriate home uh, to pursue this is, and if, in fact, the ITF is going to pursue it or not. Um, there are a lot of interrelated issues around deployment, especially in operator networks. It's also worth noting that there's a distinction between kind of uh, some operate, the operational, potential operational models for some DOE deployments are kind of orthogonal to just the existence of DOE itself. And so there's a, uh, a discussion that really has to be uh, ferreted out there. We have also identified several other areas where work might be interesting on this, and there's just no clear way to tell um, what the best way, best path forward for the ITF is among a variety of options, one of which is, well, the ITF says this is difficult, it involves too much policy, we're going to wash our hands of it and not you know, be involved in further work, uh, which of course doesn't mean that nothing happens. It only means the ITF isn't dealing with it. And then um, there is a possibility of perhaps adopting this work into the more closely aligned working groups with whatever the particular nature is, like HTTPS. HTTP BIS might pick up a part of it, DNS op might pick up a part, DPRIDE might pick up a part. 
And then even though this is not technically a working group farming buff, it is still kind of an open question of perhaps we should be moving in the direction of having a working group specifically for uh, working on these issues. And in fact, this you'll notice that the title of this particular buff is for applications doing DNS, not applications doing DOE or DOTS. You know, we're, we're trying to identify how can we uh, look more closely at these issues where the architecture of the internet could be possibly moving in a direction where the traditional stub to local resolver to um, uh, remote authoritatives is being disrupted. And um, with Doe is only one, one possible method of that happening, but not by any means the only one. Um, so the three drafts we were talking about, this is, they're probably out of scope for a, the current DOE working group, which has not been shuttered, despite, uh, it was supposed to be this grand experiment in the ITF where we could have a pop-up working group, get something done, and um, close down the working group. It, it is still kind of lingering on right now, trying to find, a, you know, like maybe the existing DOE group would be um, the area to handle a lot of these things. However, if it were to do that, it would definitely need a charter change. Um, so rechartering it is a possibility, but uh, a lot of these other issues don't really seem like they're either DOE specific or appropriate for the, where that DOE working group currently is. Um, we did real, have real this quick, informal side. When you, if you're standing by the door, there's some seats over on the far side of the room, so just make your way over, and, and if you have an empty seat, raise your hand, so make it easier for these guys to find a home. <laughs> Keep going. Um, so, uh, those of you who are not aware, there is an existing mailing list that is um, getting a fair bit of uh, active traffic uh, in discussing a lot of these issues. Um, sometimes heads off a little bit into the weeds, but you know, this is the ITF, that's what we do. Um, we're, uh, so we do have a home for discussion right now, but not a home for the actual work. Um, and so this is why we're all here to kind of decide what our next steps is. So um, we want to continue to revisit whether the topics are still um, relevant to work that we should be pursuing. You know, should uh, it doesn't make sense for the ITF to pursue it? What can we reasonably identify as our own uh, work effort? And and if we are going to work on it, where should we do it? And then ultimately, we of course be looking for people to actually write documents or contribute text to documents and so on. And I think that's, yeah, we're not doing questions now because all these discussions will come later. We have two minutes, so if you, if people have questions on the scope of the buff, now would be oh, okay. a, a quick way to, to ask them, but, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Right. Okay. No, I think. Um, Spencer Dawkins, um, I was just going to say, you, you know, on the question of deferring layer nine issues to someplace else, it would be helpful to me and maybe to other people if down the road, not now, um, people could talk about whether there is, where a, pl where a place for these individual issues to go exists. I know we can't send them there, but if it's like we have to spin up another <laughs> Oper you know, operator community or something like that, I think that that maybe changes the attractiveness of what we talk about here. Maybe even yeah. the scope of what we talk about here if we don't think that's reasonable. Right, and um, along those lines, I would also mention that while the um, ITF has typically eschewed working on layer nine, and you know, basically had the statement of we don't do policy, it is worth noticing that the technology decisions we make are absolutely greasing policy in one direction or another. So regardless of not wanting to do policy, we're still doing policy. Yeah. Um, and you'll notice that we have, um, Cale mentioned that we have, a, we have there's some work items that have been presented and discussed um, earlier. There's a few more that we have today. We gave everybody a very short slot and that slot actually includes a little bit of time of Q&A for, for clarification questions be before the discussion at the end. But the point today is therefore not to do like a technical deep dive on any of those. Um, and, and we're probably going to stop the discussion when that starts to happen. The point is to figure out whether in the overall ad space that Taylor's just outlined, uh, whether there's a, a need or, or an opportunity for the IETF to do work and then see if some of the proposed points in that space uh, 
have consensus to be talked about more technically somewhere else. Um, and hopefully, uh, personally speaking, um, at least for some of them, so if, if for none of them we come to agreement that we should do them, we're, we're done in, in, in one way, right? Um, but, but I guess the, the reason to have the buff is to see if there's a few of those where um, uh, they're uncontroversial enough that some work can be started. Some of them might need more time, but, but the hope is that at least some of them might actually be able to go forward in some form, either new working groups or recharted existing working groups or, or somehow else. So that's that's the, the point of the boss. So we, we don't necessarily want to go very deep on the technology. We frankly don't have the time for it. Um, so we're going to stop you if you start doing that. Mike. Right. Cue it up. Let's go. Uh, Do you have a clicker or you want to? I've got the clicker in my hand. You want to go for it? Yep. Ooh, that doesn't work? work right. Try again. Press the F4 or whatever it is. Okay, I can yep. do the next slide if you want. Okay. <laughs> right, here we go. Um, this, I think, is the relevant piece for us. Um, we don't believe that uh, privacy and security are optional or negotiable, really. Um, so what have we been doing for the past couple of years is we've been working on this thing called making HTTPS more accessible and easily deployed and various other things. That was a massive project and it continues, um, but we're making pretty good progress and we, we think we're reaching the point of um, diminishing returns in that regard. Uh, it is now considered simply good hygiene to have HTTPS and it's, a, it's an accepted norm, just like anyone in this room is probably expected to be brushing their teeth. We expect people to do HTTPS. It's not the only thing you need to do in order to secure your site. It's, it's just simply part of a healthy hygiene regimen. So now uh, we've spent in the past little while a little bit more attention on new problems. Um, the first one being bad people also brush their teeth. So tracking, breaches, um, all of those sorts of things. We're paying a lot of attention to those sorts of things. Um, and we're hardening the platform, dealing with nasty things like Spectre and friends, and taking the encryption thing onto new frontiers. And that means looking at um, what's left unencrypted and diving into in a little bit more detail into things like traffic analysis. I have two things here about DNS that we're looking at. We're experimenting with encrypted SNI uh, that is available in um, behind preferences in various browsers and uh, certain services support that. Um, but the point here is that we, we think that in, uh, encrypting DNS is a good thing. Uh, but we do also care about who gets that information and which services we talk to. So our principle when it comes to the trusted recursive resolver, which is our, the term that we came up with um, for the combination of encrypting DNS and choosing who you encrypt it toward, um, is that there is individual control and um, importantly here, there are strong privacy properties out of the default settings that people get. Okay. Also, with the why comes the why not. Um, this is a quote from Jeff Houston, which I think is quite relevant in this, in this context. Um, and it represents one of the major challenges that we've faced in deploying this. I think if it weren't for the fact that DNS were used for in all of these various ways and, and to enact policy and simply because it's not coherent, um, we would have shipped it already. Um, and there would be a large number of people using something like Doe in, uh, in Firefox. Uh, unfortunately, um, and we may debate whether or not this is an essential property of DNS or whether it is an unfortunate byproduct of the way that DNS has evolved. I don't want to get into details about that. I'm happy to have a drink with someone on that subject. Um, but uh, that's not the way DNS is. And of course, uh, there are the long list of reasons that have been presented in the various drafts. Uh, Tao went through a couple of those ones um, for not doing that. I don't like the ones on the right. Um, the ones on the left 
all sort of boil down to the one effective reason, and that is that DNS is an effective control point, or at least was. Oops, that has a massive lag on it. It's really annoying. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to go through in detail why all these things, why this is the case, but uh, to throw a couple of examples up here, uh, alternative name resolution services do exist. Um, and applications have name resolution or name resolu resolution like things built into them. Uh, RFC 7838 is an example of the sort of things that, we, that I'm talking about here. And um, if you are to use uh, DNS as a, as a control surface, you also need to consider all of the ways in which uh, the functions that DNS provide might be being provided in other ways. And ultimately, without engaging with endpoints and understanding the protocols that, that are involved, uh, you won't be able to have effective control. Happen to be a chair of a working group that's dealing with this one, so I thought I'd throw up a slide on this one. Uh, we have a working group uh, that is effectively dealing with exactly the same class of problem. You know, with captive portals, we're finding that the techniques that they're using for throwing the portal page up in front of someone is uh, not as effective when there's as much HTTPS as there is in the network today. And um, it turns out that the techniques there uh, almost universally don't use DNS as the basis of that. There are a couple that do. Um, they happen to be less effective than those that concentrate on strictly intercepting HTTP and clear text. But we're, we've also seen that we have less than 20% of page loads in Firefox now um, in the clear. So the opportunity for someone to do that interception is rapidly diminishing. Um, yeah. Content filtering. This is one of the hard problems for us. Um, using DNS names to decide whether content is allowed or not um, only works in the, in the very broadest sense. It can do things like overblock and underblock even. Um, for instance, if you have a particular page on a site and you want to use DNS to block that, you take out the entire domain. And when I say the entire domain, I mean not just that origin, but every co-hosted origin. You can, have, you can have quite a lot of collateral damage. And uh, doing a search on things like parental controls, all of them that I found from the first searches that I did were all endpoint software as a result. So that was my conclusion. Um, a few more, more thoughts on the, on the, on the subject. Um, we have to regard DNS as plumbing. Um, one of the things that um, we're struggling with here um, is that we get requests to throw this problem on our users and that, from our perspective, is unacceptable. Um, these are people that have other things to do and they only care about these things when it stops working. And uh, we would be doing them a disservice if we were forcing them to make decisions on these points. So where do we go from here? Long term. Applications will encrypt what they can. Uh, they will choose who and what they will trust with information. And in order to engage with um, end systems uh, and exert control, you'll have to go and talk to the person who owns the machine that's being operated. That is our ideal situation that we get into. And that is, you can't come in from the outside and impose your will upon someone without actually talking to them and getting their consent. In the short term, however, we recognize that people still heavily rely on, on DNS for many of these use cases. And there are many legitimate uses for um, the sorts of controls that people have in networks. And so what we're looking to do is have some way to disable DNS uh, at the application layer and the secured trusted resolvers and all of that business. 
uh, where those controls are in place. And it's quite difficult for us to actually automatically detect these things, but we'd like to find some ways in, in, in which we can do that. And I think, we hope that uh, others will agree with us, though I expect that we'll have a lively discussion on this, on this topic, that this is a stopgap measure only. And uh, our policy will evolve as the ecosystem evolves. And that is all I have, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have maybe time for one very quick clarification question, if one of you has one for Mark. I see Colin. Colin Jennings. Colin Jennings. Uh, as you know, I support this very same view on this, but you, you, you talk about encrypting DNS. I don't really think that's the goal. That, that is a, a mechanism along the goal, obviously. But I think no. we have to be honest, too, about the fact that one of the things that's still revealed or that we need to be working away on in this whole thing is the next thing, which is instantly we use this DNS information to make a connection to an address. And nearly all the information that was in the encrypted DNS query is instantly revealed two seconds later. Now, of course, it's not that I don't think we shouldn't encrypt the DNS. It's that I think we need to solve both of these uh, on our path, not just the first one. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Martin. Uh, Warren is on the agenda, but he seems confused by being on the agenda. Okay, sorry, we didn't know. Wh whoever is, is Warren's, uh, okay, great, thank you. It's always the ADs who mess it up. <laughs> and you don't have slides, correct? I, <clears throat> I don't know how it's any, any slides. Um, so, my name is Kenji uh, Bao. I work for Google on Chrome. I'm a product manager. I work on loading APIs, um, and DNS over GPS is one thing among the different products. Um, so, I can explain essentially like the basic principles that we, we have. So, first of all, I think at some point there was some confusion about whether or not we intended to force a DNS change to have all our users to use Google DNS. Um, we don't want to do that for a couple of reasons. One is that some of the users are currently using a DNS provider, and that DNS provider is offering different like features, like family filtering, malware detection, and whatnot. That might not be the right way to do it, but it's currently the way those users are experiencing the internet. And so if suddenly they lose this feature just by us forcing a new DNS on them, it could potentially create some um, breakage of user expectations. So that's the first point. Um, the second point is that we have a lot of um, customers in enterprise and education. And so for those, uh, we want to let them be in charge of the whole user experience. And so typically it means that we have group policy that administrator can set so that they can decide whether or not they want to and if they want to which like those server really they want to use um, yeah so i think those are the main points that i talked about in an email that i sent a while ago on the itf mailing list um, the latest update is that um, i think last week i think we sent a PSA to our public mailing list explaining our current step, which is we want to do an experiment to make sure that the implementation that we have in Chrome is reasonable, that it performs well, doesn't crash and, and whatnot. So this is just an experiment. It's not meant to be something that we are going to ship as is. And what we do is essentially we have a very short table of DNS provider that we know um, support do, And so we reached out to a couple of providers and at the moment we have five of them um, that are interested in participating and complied with a set of criteria that we, we felt were good to start with in terms of like doing an experiment. I can share more details about that if people are interested. Um, and so, yeah, so we're not changing the DNS, we're just looking what DNS the user is currently using and if it's one among the list, we are going to upgrade to the DO version of that provider. And so the intent is to measure performance metrics 
um, like health metric stability and whatnot to, to make sure that what we have is good. Um, what happened after that is still TBD. There are a lot of open questions, um, especially if you think about like, maybe should we have a UX that let users like decide to pick one of those options? How do we communicate that if they were to pick this version, the user expectation that they currently have might not hold true anymore because this provider doesn't do family self filtering, for instance. There are a lot of things like that we still need to understand. Um, and there are also countries like the UK where there are a set of things in the law that has the ISP um, with like a couple of responsibilities in terms of like filtering things and whatnot. And so I don't have a definite answer on like how we should go about that. And I'm hoping that we can run discussion about those in this uh, both and uh, the ITF this week. Thank you. Uh, we have time again for some very short clarification questions if people have them. Great, thank you. Man, this is like the timing works. Like, <laughs> Jim, I think you're up next, right? Is this you? Yes. That's me, yeah. Uh, Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to keep this very, very short. And I'm looking at another aspect of this whole problem space around the use of the Loon dot technologies that is likely to emerge as we go forward in the use of that. And primarily the focus is on the use by small things like IoT type devices, web browsers and so on. And there's a questions there about some of the operational policies about how these things are configured. How are these devices and how are these applications going to do trust management, how are they going to get a trust anchor? Would it be some combination of Acme and Dane, or is it going to be something else? How are they going to roll over these keys? How are they going to roll over any certificates that they're using for that? And also, are they going to have some kind of device configuration policy? Will we try DO first, then fall back to DOT, then fall back to vanilla DNS? Should that be written up and, and destroyed in some way? I think that's potentially an area that the ITF might want to look at personally. Similarly, we have to look at the issues around about uh, for resolver configuration, how, or sorry, discovery mechanisms. How can these devices and applications find a suitable resolver that they're supposed to use? Either it's provided on the local network, or maybe it's provided by the vendor themselves. And do we want to have the situation where a large number of these things perhaps have these IP addresses hardwired into them? And that potentially is potentially disruptive. Now, from my point of view, this all sounds like statements of the bleeding obvious, but the fact is it's not really written down anywhere, and I think that's potentially something that really needs to be documented somehow, somewhere. And I think myself, maybe the ITF might be the place to do it. Second thing, there's wider issues around the whole issues of documentation issues. There's quite a number of big gaps there that I think need to be filled. We just have to figure out ways to try and mitigate the security and privacy risks of the use of these technologies. And we all want these things to be used well but we also have to understand the potential downsides and parental hazards if they're not used in the appropriate way. I think we also have to look at some of the threat model stuff, the use cases, because that doesn't seem to have been done yet. And we've also got concerns about potential information leakage as well and how to minimize the risk of that happening as well. And then also another big concern, something that really worries me, is the potential for malice or accidental damage, for example, if the resolving server gets comp compromised in some way, and I'm using the term resolving server deliberately loosely, and if it starts handing back bad data to the end clients, how can those end clients validate that data or disregard it? Say, for example, if they're giving out bogus information and sending people to a fake version of a bank's website or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that's another area to be looked at. And a real worry I have is that if these things are compromised, particularly in an IoT type setting, the potential for downsides can be quite nasty. You know, somebody starts switching off, switching on your toaster from the other side of the world, or disables a door lock on your house while you're away from home and nothing can be done about it. So I think that's another area that could be at least documented and looked at, and maybe this is something I think that the ITF could perhaps take on board, and with that I'll take questions, if any. Thanks, yeah, we have a quite a few minutes left if people have clarification questions or we can uh, save the minutes and use them at the end. Clarification questions for Jim? Do you stop? No. Everybody had very heavy lunches. We haven't gotten to the free school David discussion David is next.
Hi, um, my name is David Skenazi. I work at Google. And this is a proposal for how like servers communicate dough. So I'm gonna just make a very like overview presentation of this. And I, I personally believe that it fits in with what's been discussed before in terms of like the model and how we reason about dough. And this is just maybe one more tool we could have in our dough toolbox. Um, so this is also work with Nick Sullivan and Jesse Kipp at Cloudflare. Um, so one problem with some of the Doe deployments today is that some browsers will just send all of their DNS to one Doe server, so to one cloud provider. And so that has two problems. On one hand, it's inefficient because let's say if you're resolving names that use DNS for load balancing or DNS for geographical picking, geographically picking the right data center, going through a Doe server that's all the way somewhere else might be inefficient. Also, you expose all of your browsing history to that DNS provider, also unideal. So how can we move forward? It's help there be more Doe adoption by like, not having these problems as much. So the proposed solution, or a proposed solution, is somewhat inspired by HSTS, but don't think about it too much that way because that is a terrible analogy. Um, and the idea is the HTTP server, the origin, tells the client, by the way, I also run a Doe server. And if you want to resolve me, I would prefer you use this one, but client is completely free to do what it wants. It could ignore this. And so the current proposal is an HTTP header. It looks like this, and it basically gives you a Doe URI and an H, because it has to be cached. Um, the one way to deploy this, which I think is practical, is we already have a history right now where there's a number of Doe servers. It's not incredibly large, and some of them have been vetted in terms of like how much data they log and all that. And so browsers can have a list of those Doe servers in the UI. But one thing you can do is if, as a browser, you have that list and you receive this header for something that's in the list, you can say, okay, when I want to visit this website, I will go to that list. So one example is if like you have a big CDN, for all of the websites that CDN serves, it can say, this is the Doe server of that CDN. So you don't end up having to resolve to another CDN who doesn't really want to give you the best results. Um, one important point, and this is what makes it very different from HSTS, is that this is a performance feature. It allows you to skip a jump through another Doe server. It's not a security feature, so you can fall back. If that Doe server that was recommended doesn't work, you fall back to whatever DNS mechanisms you had before. That could be another Doe server, it could be DNS server 53, it could be whatever you generally use. Um, and uh, one point that was brought up that I just really want to mention is, like anything that the client caches, it can be used as a tracking vector or super cookie. So you want to implement, if like, we ever want to move forward with this, we want to implement mitigations such as only having a small list of what those servers there are to avoid this uh, servers just providing one unique Doe URI per client and allowing tracking. Um, and of course, you also want to double key this uh, caching of information based on the origin and iframes and everything to avoid these concerns. And that's all I had. So simple concept. I, I think you will have clarification questions. It's the usual suspects. They never ask <laughs> clarification questions. Please feel, feel free to refer I, them to the box. This is Daniel Khan Gilmore. I'm asking a clarification question. Um, you said, uh, just to, to clarify what the Doe preference header would mean, you said it, you use it to look up but you didn't say what domain names it would look up. So I think it would be useful to clarify uh, the scope of what the Doe preference header refers to. Sorry, that uh, is indeed the most important part of the talk. I must have forgotten that. Uh, so let's say if you go to browse to HTTPS called slash slash example.com, it is for that same origin and that origin only. So you add a the header, like next time you want to resolve example.com, you come to this Doe server, not for any other domain name. Children domains? Domain names? A um, records only? Non-A records? 
Uh, currently, it is very strictly uh, to that origin. The exact but, name. The exact name. Uh, only we, for A and quad A records or other names, other, uh, other types? We don't currently specify that. That's a good question. I guess I would assume mainly in quad A, but there are other talks of new records that are important in this space. So maybe just for all records on that name could be the right way to go. Um, yeah, I mean, this is probably this is very interesting work. Um, uh, there's been some conversations that have been doing this kind of thing for a while, so I'm glad to see you move forward. Um, I think there's some technical details which I'm not entirely sure I love here, but um, uh, I, I, you know, something we can work out. Um, uh, I think the uh, um, perhaps probably the most interesting question is: Is it worth trying to expand the scope? Um, I think two points. One is it worth trying to expand the scope outside of just the origin itself to children domains, for instance, or other domains in the cert. Um, there are questions worth asking, is it worth priming this, this, this thing with an IP address for the resolver? Um, because one difficulty here is because if, if what you are is your Facebook and you operate you know, dns.facebook.com and www.facebook.com, and what has to happen is that every time I want to go to, and that those have the same TTL, then every time I want to go to facebook.com, I have to look up the DNS of facebook.com be my primary resolver. And, and like, obviously, not going to really solve my problem. So um, um, yeah, maybe this can be solved with long TTLs on A versus B, but it's a problem that has to be dealt with because otherwise you won't get a privacy benefit. You're always hoping for. Well, I closed the lines already because we want to do clarification questions, and they're getting extremely detailed, which is not what yeah. this was supposed to be about. So, so um, okay. please keep it at, at the clarification level. Uh, thanks. And yeah, that is a good question. These are open questions that we can dig in later. Um, can you clarify whether or not um, when you say dns.example.net, is there no, any notion that this DNS partner has to be operated by the same company? And if not, does it mean that user has to trust not only that website, but also this like other provider? Um, as currently documented, it doesn't require any like cooperation between these two because I don't think that's enforceable from a client. That example.com is served by CDN FUBAR. Um, but the, so what exactly is the? Uh, so the, the, the concern would be maybe as a user, I trust example.com, but I don't trust evil.example.net. Ah, yes. Because so, they are going to resell information and whatnot. So, and this is why this is very clearly a preference. And so, example.com tells you, I like DNS at evil.com. As a user, you say, oh, sorry, I don't like evil.com. I'm not going to follow your preference. So, it's, it becomes a local client policy matter. Uh, Robert Story, USC ISI. You say that this is for performance, but the those servers they hand you might not necessarily be the, the closest one. Your ISP might be much closer, and it might be an initial hit, but then with caches, it would be faster to go through your ISP. Uh, absolutely. And so then it becomes the responsibility of whoever's serving that website to try to be smart about how their users or what the best server is for them. Um, at the end of the day, if they are, their DOS server that they run is further, and yeah, then they should just say, use your ISPs. Right. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, Chris, you're up next. Hi, so uh, I'm Chris Box. Andy Fiddler is uh, connected remotely. Um, like Andy, I work for BT, although I specialize in the design of the EE mobile network. So this is to, to ask whether there is um, a consensus that there are issues that we need to, to resolve. Um, so one of those is the DOE protocol creates technical challenges for operators and other providers. And um, as an example, so we are looking at um, deploying, a, well, a, creating a proof of concept of, of the DOE, DOE resolver in our network so that we can then assess um, if it's viable, how we're going to roll it out to the network. Um, but in order to prove that viability, we need to address these challenges, which I'll come on to. 
Could you go a bit closer to the microphone? Um, yeah. So the the, the IETF um, we think should consider developing a, a best current practice which documents these concerns and provides the appropriate guidance. So if I come on to what those are, so the first is how operators and enterprise networks can offer DOE and DOT servers. And I, I, most of these issues are common to both DOE and DOT. So this in part re resolves around um, discovery of local resolvers, which resolvers are available, what policies do they have, privacy policies, other features, um, and selection of that. Now that there are two existing drafts that I, I'm aware of that talk into this space. Um, we need to build a complete picture there. Um, also how these operator and enterprise DOE servers can be used across home, mobile, and enterprise networks. So when, obviously when there's mobility between those networks, um, there's gonna be a process of discovery and selection and you're not always gonna want to choose the local resolver. We could also do with assessing what's the impact of this technology on network and server performance, on load testing, on capacity and resilience planning. So one example of that is the, uh, the lack of ECS, client subnet, um, will drive changes in, in where the traffic is present on the network. Also the impact on existing infrastructure, so load balances, um, captive portals as we mentioned, NAT64, how's that gonna work? Um, proxies, CDNs. The impact to the customer premises equipment. So out of the box, when the customer first opens it and puts it in the system, how are they gonna um, connect and be taken through that process? Um, should we have uh, a DOE resolver on the, on the CPE like we do at the moment? Well, we, do, we have a DNS resolver at the moment. What's its role? Um, in this new environment? How do we manage the certificates if it is going to be offering its own DOE service there? Uh, providing DOE and DOT service in split DNS environments. This has been mentioned a number of times. I know there's a, there's a draft which um, is attempting to address this issue, so I hope that covers it off completely. The interactions between applications and operating system DNS settings. So do we, do we conclude that it is better for the operating system to, uh, to implement the, to be the DNS client? Um, the advantage there is that it is one point um, that holds the settings, the preferences and the selection, um, or is it better for the applications to do that? And if we do, if we say the applications need to do that, that opens up the issues of managing all that diversity. If it's in the operating system, we then need to go on to what are the right preferences in the operating system? What do we need to expose to the user so that they can say what they want from, from their DNS provider? How do clients will handle policy negotiation with servers? Um, so we've, we've mentioned the privacy policies. There's a, there's a draft that says, yes, we can learn about um, this resolver offers these policies and features, um, but also could this be a negotiation? Could the, could the uh, client device say, I'm willing to accept ECS prefix length of this? Um, or if any, I'm not willing to accept any ECS, I'd rather it was not sent. Um, could that be a negotiation? The, if, it's, if the DNS is presented simply in the operating system, that's, that's one case. If, if we think there is a role for applications to manage their DNS settings, um, then 
let's say, okay, we have, we have 10 different applications on this device. They've all got different selections. Um, if there's also security software on that device, like an antivirus or something that's attempting to secure the device, is that security software going to have the ability to, to audit the DNS selections of all of the applications? And, you know, so that it can ensure that, that malware has not subverted one of them and decided to send you know, the Facebook app off to a different destination. Obviously an easier task if it's only the operating system, but settings that need to be checked. Uh, authentication of DOE and DOT resolvers. So let's say that my device is on the IATF Wi-Fi. I've discovered that there is an ITF DOE resolver. Um, I've learned about its policies. Um, I've checked that against my user's preferences. The user says, yeah, if there's a good resolver, it's local, it's really private and secure, use that one. Um, we need to state what, how do we, um, what are the authentication steps we need to go through to confirm that it really is the IETF and it's not just someone saying they are. There's management of TLS sessions at DNS query rates. So what do we do with ticket durations, with restarts? And finally, the, the options that operators can use to, to minimize the TLS overheads for, for DOE and DOT traffic. So that, that, that was an example list of areas that we think there is, there is a need for some work. Um, some of them are already being worked on. Um, so the, this is just an open question to say, who's willing to work to identify the, the items that do require work with somewhere, um, to check that overlap, and if we identify there is something, um, you know, who, who are the volunteers to work on it? Thank you. And we have some clarification questions lined up by Barbara. Barbara Stark, at and Thank you for bringing this. Um, I'm glad to see that one of the presentations um, today actually looked at operator, network operator issues. I'm quite honestly, given that the list of um, drafts that sort of precipitated having this BOF were all about operational concerns, I was actually kind of surprised that only one out of six presentations actually tried to say we need to talk about operational concerns. Um, as a network operator, I can tell you that this has risen now to one of the top concerns as to the potential impact that this can have on changing network patterns, where traffic comes from, the paths um, traffic takes coming into our network, will it still use some of those private peering links if it's being resolved by somebody else? Um, the potential on calls to our help desk when things don't work the way they're expected to work. Um, those calls aren't be going to be going to Cloudflare or Google no. or Mozilla or any of those. They're going to be coming to our help desks. Mm -hmm. This is huge. We've got to work on this. Um, and it needs to not be given short shrift or shortchanged in any way. And quite honestly, Absolutely, I want to work on these things with you, wherever they happen. Um, I'd really like to see if at least one of the chairs, if there is an ADD group, is an operator, so that it's not that operators are some sideline here. Apologies, it's by no means do we want to sideline operators, right? And <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad people agree. So, but, you know, this is probably on, on the chairs mostly for not reaching out more and trying to get additional operator presentations lined up, but we did manage to get one, uh, which we're qu now quite happy about <laughs> before also. But, but yeah, obviously we, we agree. Um, uh, and thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Terry Manderson, no particular hat. Would you mind going back to the previous slide, please? Sure. Would you consider the authentication requirements for DOE and DOT resolvers or protection of application-specific DOE and DOT resolver configuration 
to cover the uh, the trust anchor store issue and ensuring that the appropriate gating and validation and sanctity of the TA store uh, is in that scope? And if not, why? So I don't know what the, the right answer is, but I just know that, that yes, there, there are there is work to be done to, to define exactly how the, all this can, can be operated securely. Perhaps then you might want to add that as another um, Yeah, this, this isn't intended to be an exclusive an list. It's just list. To I say understand that, that. that. There is work there. Right. It was just a glaring gap in my mind. Sure. Thank you. Lorenzo Coligli, why, why is this about dough? I, I think the first slide is, the first bullet on the first slide is incorrect. The dough protocol itself does not create any of these technical challenges. The technical challenges are created by using a server that is not the one that the network configures you to use. So this is not specific to dough, it's not specific to dot. If you weren't able to, um, if the operator weren't already able to rewrite and man in the middle UDP DNS, which they are today, the same problems would exist. So I think, you know, reframing it in terms of Doe is wrong. Um, I happen, we, we happen not to have a Doe implementation, we have a DOT implementation in Android. And that creates some of the challenges, but we, it, it actually doesn't create many of the challenges you have here because we chose not to change the deployment model and to use either a user selected DNS resolver or to use to upgrade the network provided resolver to encryption. And so it, it may seem kind of specious, but I think it, it's unfair to blame Doe for this. What the problem is, is that application selection or client selection of the DNS resolver, the thing is that right now the network tells the client what to use and the client doesn't want to do that anymore. So I think you, <laughs> blaming the protocol for that is like shooting the messenger. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I would say that it's, it's, it is RFC 8484 that has um, brought this to the point where it's, it's likely that there's going to be a big transition of, of the DNS traffic. Um, I agree that, yes, it, if the ISP is deploying a, a DOE server or a, any kind of encrypted DNS server and the devices are all using that, then a lot of the issues become much easier. Um, there are still some that remain, such as how do you manage that traffic? I'm going to cut the lines for the clarification questions after Kathleen, and then please be quick. Uh, and I'm glad to see this turn out to be a clapping contest now, uh, which is... <laughs> uh, Ted Hardy, if you could go forward uh, just to the middle slide, please. Uh, first, I'm very, very sorry that this was not an exhaustive list because I was very tired after reading it. And I, I'm really sorry that you're having all of these issues. I tend to agree with what uh, Lorenzo Caliti said, though, that a fair number of these issues occur um, if you let the user trust whatever DNS they're going to trust, um, uh, irrespective of whether the, the, it's transported in clear text, whether it's transported over uh, TLS or, or over OA, uh, DOH. And I also think that there's a fair number of these where in the performance side of this, um, there's really kind of no difference between this performance issue and the DOT performance issues, right? You're gonna see TLS start times, you'll have a concern about that, you'll have HTTP overhead. You, you need to do a, a bunch of that stuff if what you're just looking at is resolver performance. If what you're looking at is, is the sorts of issues that Barbara were bringing up about where the traffic is coming into your network, I think that's again though because you're not letting the user control the resolution. If, if you look at any mechanism by which the user is in control of the resolution, you can get these results. And I think before you go and ask the question on your final slide, looking for overlap with deprive, DOH, or other operational group, it'd be really handy just to go through this and say, if I let the user trust uh, a resolver on uh, of, of their choice and did not make any efforts to, to insert a resolver um, uh, over and above their, their initial choice, uh, does this same thing happen, yes or no? Uh, in similar for the performance issues, once you have that trusted answer, no matter where you got it, would this same performance issue happen, yes or no? And I think the result of that, once you got, got rid of all the ones where there's this huge overlap, you could really narrow down into things an ADD group would do. 
I think the others are not necessarily unimportant, but if you tackle them for just this one delivery mechanism, you actually haven't tackled your problem very well at all. So I, ha I had cut the lines after Kathleen. I'm, I'm sorry. We, we, this is seriously qualification questions, and, and we do have one more presentation and then a longer open mic session. Okay. Okay. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, Eka was still aligned. Kathleen, Eka, you were also did the, you, you decided you're not aligned anymore. Yeah, okay, fine. please. Um, Genji from Google. I just wanted to know, um, to, to say that I've spent a lot of time talking to the ISPs and I've learned a lot in the process. And I feel that, like, look around, like there is a lot of people. There are some hard questions to solve. And I don't have answers. And so if there are things on that slide, maybe not on the slide that we, we could have ways that are rational, I think we should consider them. Thank you. Kathleen Moriarty. So on the DOE clients handling policy, it's not just that, it's whether they have an opportunity to select what they're using for DNS. So if the application browser on the client side doesn't have a choice and they're not behind the a network firewall to help interfere with that choice, um, they may be unaware of where their DNS is going. And I mean, there's nothing to stop a DOE server, server from doing some of the inspection capabilities from, you know, other DNS services, right? So. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jim, you're up again. If you can do it in nine minutes, we're exactly back on time. Yeah. Including questions. Yeah. I'll keep this very short, and Dale just said keep it at a Jim Reed height level. Thanks very much. Very, very short one here. This was the basis of a, a draft that uh, John Dickinson and myself kicked around before the Prague meeting, but it never got to the stage that was ready to be chucked over the wall to the ITF. But I think it identifies some other potential areas of well, potential work, um, particularly the issues of the interaction between HTTP and DNS, and between what is perhaps notion a web server and the web browser type activities. And the potential exploits there for things like cache poison attacks and, and hijacking, and how can we deal with unsolicited, unsolicited HTTP push messages going to the web browsers? 8484 says a little bit about that, but I think that perhaps needs to be expanded and filled out a little bit more. I think we've probably not done enough work there on the threat model there and looked at it. I think that could be looked at. And also, what's going to be the scope of any HTTP push messages? Is it going to be for the browser as a, as a single global entity, or is it for an individual frame or a tab in the browser? Uh, what's going to be the time to live value for any of those push data that's going to be shoved back to it? Also, maybe we need to articulate something a little bit more clearly that you know, whenever we get a, do a DNS lookup, irrespective of the transport protocol, the mechanism, if you use DOT, or if you use DO, or if you use vanilla DNS, we should, broadly speaking, get the same, ba same answer back every time generally speaking, modular some things maybe say around about the issues of um, clever cache, class, uh, content delivery networks changing the responses back. But broadly speaking, you should get the same answer. That's I think, is something that we should try to make sure is, is, is enshrined in all these um, protocol deployments. Also, um, for web caches, um, what do we do about negative caching? Again, 8484 says a little bit about that but maybe there's a little bit more de depth to be uh, plumbed in there, particularly around the use of um, uh, aggressive use, uh, negative caching thing, which just came out as um, 81.98 fairly recently. Also, there are some things about some of the, like, some of the newer, fancier DNS features, which are left unseen at the moment. If, for example, a web client is using TSIG, how does the web browser or the trusted resolver handle that TSIG data that's shoved over the HTTP channel? What do we do other things to do with um, DNS header bits? What, what does it mean when a web browser sends a query with the um, recursive, recursion desired but not set? How does a web resolver deal with that? Does it give back a non recur Does it give an answer? Does it answer from cache? Does it try to resolve that query? I think things like that need to be perhaps worked on. Also, we need to look at potentially, I think, other non-query related DNS activities. For example, notify messages or perhaps even dynamic updates. Should or should not a trusted resolver or a door resolver deal with those kind of requests? Also, should we honor or make sure that we honor the IANA route if we're on the public internet? 
I think this is a general thing that applies not just to door resolvers, but to um, vanilla DNS resolvers as well. There's a potential here that the IANA route potentially could be hijacked or bypassed or ignored. I think it'd be good to have write something down about that. And also we've got all this other interesting DNS group people have mentioned about ECS. There's also eDNS options. Should we support DNSSEC? And by that, what I'm meaning is that a trusted resolver should return the DNSSEC related resource records, not necessarily validate themselves, but pass them back to the end client so the end client can choose to validate them for themselves if it wants to or not. So I think things like that probably need to be explained because those requirements at the moment are not quite clear. And I think we're kind of leaving it as a, a, a soon, making an assumption that um, anybody that's operating a, a door resolver will actually do these things. And if it's a website, it might not choose to do those activities. So I think it'd be helpful if we tried to try and clear some requirements around that there. And with that, I think I'm done. Yes. Excellent. So I'll take any questions or clarifications and then open up the floor for popcorn and beer. Ben Schwartz. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, I, as Doe Chair, I do think that this work is largely in scope for Doe as currently chartered. Um, so if you want to bring this kind of work to the Doe Working Group, the Working Group is open. OK. Uh, I, I do want to ask a couple of questions. Do you, do you think that these requirements do not currently exist? Ooh, that's a very good question. <laughs> I would need to look at a whole bunch of um, RFCs to know for definite, but there are certain things that are probably not written down in terms of what a resolver's requirements are being general for a regular DNS resolver. So I'm not sure if anything written down that specifies that, but I do think that's another area that perhaps needs to be developed and scoped out a little bit further. Okay, thank you. Uh, and also, are you, uh, are you particularly concerned about um, implementations that essentially are buggy or fail to comply with existing standards, or uh, are you primarily concerned with implementations that are compliant with existing standards? Uh, if they're compliant, fine. I don't have any great problem with that. I, it's not so much, I think, buggy or failure to implement these things, but sorry, not, it's not so much buggy or, or faulty implementations. It's the fact that there might be a minimum set of requirements we should expect these resolvers to implement and support. And it's not really clear what that, should, what that, th what that thing should be. Okay. And just finally, what do you see the connection, uh, what connection do you see between these, these features and Doe? <sighs> well, it depends how the Doe is going to be implemented in the back end in the, in the server side. Is it going to be a web server? Is it going to be a regular DNS server that's got a Doe personality attached to it? If it's the former, then we have to look at these other kind of issues. If it's the latter, some of that stuff will almost certainly be implemented in bind with a front end module or unbound with the front end module or whatever it is. So broadly speaking, that latter case there probably isn't a problem. But if it's going to be done with something else, then maybe it is going to be a problem. I think we're in it? line or yeah. I'm queuing for the next line. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you are uh, organized. Right, anybody have any more questions for Jim for this particular slide? No, okay, so we are on time and two minutes early, which is excellent. Thank you all for being uh, willing to be cut so by much in time. Um, so so the, the scope here certainly feels larger than, than what would fit into one working group in the ITF traditionally, that's very clear. And, and some of you know the work is maybe a bit more controversial than others. But the point I think of the, of the buff, and, and Barry, correct me if I'm wrong, is to figure out whether there's some of, of the shopping list of things that have been presented by, and not presented, there must be more, is, is uncontroversial enough that it might find a home either in an existing working group or in a rechartered existing working group or in a new working group. Um, and if, if you can maybe focus on uh, making constructive process along those lines, um, we, we might avoid a repeat of the last meeting. Please. Thanks. Uh, Wes Hardiker, ISI. So one of the things I noticed about these presentations were that they were uh, technical and down in the weeds a lot, um, in, in a good way. But I wanted to bring up some sort of higher level view in terms of architecturally, you know, how we think about things. And first off, so you're going to have to bear with me for a minute or two, but protocols are not evil, right? 
they're, they're, they're inherently themselves not evil. And it's a question of whether, what we do with them in the IETF. Um, companies forcing a protocol to use, you know, forcing a user to, to use them can be kind of evil at times. But most of the time, you know, they do it for the right reasons. So one thing I noted is that we have many technologies today that send packets in different directions than maybe the ISP expected. VPNs in particular do that. A uh, user logs into an ISP, they, they jump through a VPN, and they're no longer sending traffic the same way. Well, then but all the traffic is going the same way, so you're really part of a different network until you get to the point of using something like a split VPN. Well, when you're using a split VPN, some of your traffic goes some way and some traffic goes the other way. And most split VPNs actually send all of your DNS traffic down the VPN. So to some extent, you know, Doe and similar technologies where you're routing stuff a different direction for DNS is kind of like using a split uh, VPN to a large extent. Um, but there's a significant difference in that, and I'm going to harp back on this a few times, the user typically has awareness that they're using a, a split VPN or a VPN at all. They know that the traffic is going in a different direction, and they may talk to a different help desk, as the operators earlier were wanting to point out. So what does change, right? If, Wes, if we already... Wes, please, we, we got 20 minutes, and there's 20 people in line. <laughs> that means everybody gets one minute. Yeah, the line's grown. OK. Uh, so what does change? The difference is that we're doing DNS per application or DNS per protocol uh, differences, and that's actually quite different than existing stuff. So I'm going to run through my list of six questions without commentary. <laughs> does the IETF need this to be standardized? Is there a point to standardization? Does this promote alternate names namespaces? ICANN currently has on this on their worry deck. Do we care that we're promoting a per protocol or per application solution? We get caught in the tussle a lot of encrypted data center, um, like, no, I'm going to skip that one, never mind. <laughs> so it boils down to what's the benefit of standardizing this? And if we were going to re-architecture things today, would we actually pick Doe, or are we using Doe as an end run around existing network problems and operational problems that maybe we'd solve a different way if we'd had a choice? Stephen? We're going to alternate between. All right, Stephen Farrell, I have 57 different things to say. Uh, so in terms of what to do, I think there's clearly some parts of this are work to be done in the ITF, I think. Um, I can't see a sane way to split that up into multiple working groups that makes any sense to me anyway. Maybe it exists. Um, I Personally, I think it was a mistake to, to, to charter Deep Five and Doe separately. So my kind of suggestion for something to think about would be to put all of this into one working group to look at DNS privacy and the root and applications doing the DNS and the protocol and operations things that surround that. So that'd be my suggestion. Could you, could you say one or two things very quickly that you think would be non-controversial that you would see us taking forward? Uh, so I think the split DNS, if there's any protocol mechanism needed there, I think uh, any performance kind of measurement type work seems to be reasonable. Um, the discovery of Dot versus 53 versus Do. Thank you. Uh, David Lampater. Um, I actually have a clar clarification question uh, for David. Um, so um, you mentioned that the, the information that you should use a particular DOH server for a particular domain should be keyed to whatever identifies me so it doesn't turn into a super cookie. That does imply that this caching is extremely limited in, in its use, right? So probably only refreshed connections to the same CDN or something where you might want to ask the CDN to refresh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sorry, we, we had this slot for clarification questions. We want to talk about the big picture now. Talk, yes, talk, to David, talk to David offline. I am please. arriving at the point. So okay. um, the, the thing is um, that the end result is you're, you're never going to have a destination specified DOH server for the initial connection. So you're just not going to remember it for long enough. So that, that pushes me down the direction of um, the DOH server or DOT server or whatever. It's going to be specified by the network still like we are doing currently in the end. That is where, why, where the, the path leads me down to. Phil Baker, it strikes me that this discussion is, has been technology-led, and the technology is DNS. And for me, the problem is establishing a connection with a website or other site in the face of an adversary who's trying to interfere with that connection. If you know Kazakhstan's currently man in the middling, the entire country on TLS. 
And so when we look at these things, I think that we've got to look at the Gestalt because if you're trying to make that connection and you've got to run around for doing the DNS, you should be thinking about how you do the TLS certificate at the same time. Because if you don't, then you're going to end up with two technologies to do a workaround and two points of vulnerability. And at the moment in the ITF, you've got Doe and Deprive and multiple DNS focus groups. I think that if you were to charter a new group, you should, you know, it's very fine to have tech groups focused on one technology, but at the mo to add a fourth group to DNS alone, I think would be a mistake. <laughs> All right. We're done here. <laughs> So this, other, this, but this is not what this buffer is about. This buffer is specifically about a technical scope along the protocols that were mentioned. Yeah, but you're trying to solve a problem. And if you're trying to solve a it, problem... It sounds like you want to ask for a different buffer. Roland. Yeah, um, Roland Freshek. Um If you're going to... Uh, uh, progress this. The one thing that I missed in, in the discussions, so it popped up this fetid list of trusted resolvers, right? How is that list composed? That at least should somehow be the subject of a draft. Because if that turns into a cabal of like the cap forum, that takes away a lot of uh, control from users. Right now, if I want to change my DNS as a user, there are a handful of operating systems and I can work out how to change that. If every application does that and comes with its own list and there is no control whatsoever of how that list is composed, what does that mean for me as a user? Because basically all of the, I, I lose control rather than gain privacy. And I think that is something that isn't getting discussed enough and should at least be in scope for this kind of work. Hi, Eric Shkorla. So, I mean, this is like, I like that bolded list, it was very long. Um, I think there's some interesting things to work on hiding in that list and some things we should not attempt to work on. Um, the interesting things to work on, um, I think, are the work on measure, performance measurement and performance analysis and, and performance, et cetera, of these DOE and DOT technologies. Um, there's a quite interesting NR, NRW talk um, yesterday about this. So I think that's something which has some interesting results um, that if you haven't seen, um, that we well, the kind of thing we want to dig into. Um, I think discovery of the sort of behavior of the local network um, is an interesting topic. Um, as I think um, Andy Grover had a draft on this and Martin alluded to, um, you know, in the current environment, you know, it's a commonly used control point and having the application be able to detect that at least for now and deal with it is something which like is of interest, at least in the short term. Um, uh, I think uh, the things that I think are not gonna be helpful to work on are the, um, the validity or goodness or badness of the, um, applications opting to um, choose their own DNS resolvers and tunneling to them, um, of the users being able to choose their own DNS resolvers um, without the network's help, um, or conversely, the network interfering with the user's DNS resolution. Um, those are things which will um, not have um, good outcomes, um, as I think you'll see by the large amount of heat generated both here and the last time. So I was it seems like there's plenty of good work to do, but writing off bad work, which will just cause a lot of pain to not, and not have consensus is not something good thing to do. Roberto. Uh, Roberto Peon. Um, first of all, the great thing about DNS is there's never a correct answer for anything. Um, and you know, let that sink in because it's it's going to be true of any of the things that we decide, including where we put this work. Um, I have a question, however, um, which is there seem to be a lot of parallels with the discussion going on here and discussions that were happening um, around the time when we were looking to standardize HTTP2 in particular around having requirements on TLS and what that was going to do to intermediaries and what that, what that was going to do to network operators. And I think it's probably worthwhile to think back on those times. I know that's, you know, learning from history is sometimes things we avoid, but there might be some history we can learn from here in terms of how this might actually impact things. Oh, just a reminder, thanks. Okay. So I am in favor of having a working group I don't know if it belongs in art. I was, you know, I don't know if it's also ops because we have v6 ops, which helps us helps us address operational issues around IPv6 deployment, and maybe that would be something. But in any case, we really do need a working group because we need to address the network operational issues that come about from this. Because what we're hearing, you know, if I look at uh, Martin's slides, is 
you know, we're going to be turning this default on and therefore obviating the user's choice and taking place of the user's choice. The user chose to download us and we'll make all other choices for them, but that's beside the point. Um, but I, think, we need, I think that's not a correct summary of what Martin said. We need I, to, I do understand your point, but that, that was not what Martin said. We need to discuss the operational issues. We need to have a working group where we can do this and we need to really get started on the discussion of the charter as soon as possible. Yari Arko Erickson. So um, I have two points. The first point is that I um, would like to see a working group that addresses the operational issues. And obviously, we have some work to do to, to narrow down what, what that exact list of issues is. But we, we would like to have a working group. Um, and the other point is that there's there's actually several issues that and we sort of always seem to be focused on some some aspect of that and not necessarily seeing the full full picture so we've had lots of discussion today on like dns filtering and and uh, uh split dns and um, blocking and, and so forth and you know i have some views about that topic it's not you know a particularly a hot topic for me but it seems to be for, for a lot of the crowd here and a lot of the discussion but but there are other things um so I, I think like the, the concept of centralized DNS and like applications that would have a small set of uh, places that they call home every time a user does something does scare me a lot. And you know, it has it's, it's wide open for surveillance and other reasons uh, for for um, all kinds of bad things to happen. So I don't think we should go there. Um, that's potentially another thing that we could have recommendations on that don't um, have this like one view of the world um, default thing. If you can spread things to, to many different places, that, that's great. But if, if we are centralizing whatever is today in 10 million different DNS servers locally into a few things in the world, that's a very bad outcome for the internet. I think the ITF should say uh, that's not a good, good model. Thank you. Um, just just a quick note, there are like 10 people queued and less than 10 minutes left, so lines are closed. Uh, Leslie Daigle, uh, first I would like to say uh, thank you to Jim Reed for um, the second presentation, not that I'm not thanking him for the first, um, because I do think those his points there were ones that actually do need to be articulated consciously, that it may be inherently assumed as given in some minds, and I think it's not in others. Um, what I'm hearing in a lot of this discussion is actually a call for applications are calling for um, different functionality in the internet naming system. Um, I think that it is therefore wrong to talk about it in terms specifically of the DNS and what this says to our conceptions of DNS and what we can do to the DNS going forward. I think this is actually a, an architectural problem um, and I think it should be addressed as an architectural problem. As it stands, I think there's a first order of business would be to define what is it that we actually mean by an application today? Because as described, uh, Mozilla becomes an Apple service um, because it's no longer the case that you have your application running on your machine and you have your network configured, but in fact, your network may be functioning fine and your application will stop working because of some configuration deep in its bowels where it relies on the internet um, for doing dough and you have no idea what the heck is going on. I realize that that is hardly unique to uh, that particular aspect. It's hardly unique to Mozilla. It's hardly unique to this particular case of dough. Our phones do it all the time, which is why I think it's worth stopping and having the architectural question of, first of all, what is an application? What is a service? What is a naming system as, that we think is actually useful and usable uh, in today's internet? Ben Kaduk, uh, so I like uh, both of Leslie's points, branching sort of from the first and Jim's second talk in terms of concrete work items that might come out, uh, sort of writing down what has up to now been presumably shared assumptions that have not previously been written down, seems useful. You know, use the IANA route, uh, your local ISP has knowledge about how to make your local ISP work well, that sort of thing. Uh, Eric Klein. I was just uh, two points. One, I was going to agree with Lorenzo earlier. It's the, an operating system can do this on behalf of all applications without the application's knowledge. So if you want to keep the same acronym, I would offer that it's avoiding designated DNS. Uh, 
And um, secondly, I also agree with um, Leslie. I was wondering whether or not the kind of thing that comes out of this isn't going to be uh, an IAB Marnu report style document, um, given that so much of what needs to be said may be non-technical or just sort of reporting. Very hard to take a stance on some of this. Ben Schwartz. So uh, I've heard a lot of concerns about DNS-related operational issues. Uh, we have a working group for DNS-related operational issues in DNS Op. Uh, so I think that we should take those issues and send them to DNS Op. Uh, I do think if you spent some time in DNS Op recently, you might notice that it does not, in fact, seem to spend a lot of time on DNS-related operational issues. Uh, it is acting as the DNS working group and standardizing actual protocol-related uh, technical matters in, in the DNS, and that's important work. Uh, but I think that you know it may be time to do a little bit of a refactor on our various DNS-related groups. I could certainly imagine ultimately having a DNS group that handles both the, what most of what's in DNS op and DPrive and DIL, which are all essentially technical DNS-related questions, and a DNS op working group, which is in fact focused on ensuring that DNS operators are uh, are, are sharing best practices and able to implement those specifications. Daniel Con gilmore uh, ACLU. I do think that there's work that needs to be done here. Uh, I think I'm in agreement with Ben and with what Stephen said earlier about trying to merge together some of the different places where this conversation is happening in the IETF. Um, I think that the most critical thing where multiple presentations have kind of maybe even disagreed with themselves today um, has to do with questions about uh, what it means to uh, give the to, to continue to give the user some level of control here. Uh, the network wants to enforce their will on the user. The application wants to enforce their will on the user. The operating system wants to enforce their will on the user. Uh, we know that we can't give the user the choice because no user wants to make this choice. There's a fundamental problem there. We don't talk about that uh, here at the IETF. And so I don't know how we grapple with it, but that seems like what's missing. Uh, John Reed, Akamai, um, I had a whole thing prepared, but I'll just say what he said. Uh, but uh, secondly, I think I've heard an argument in favor of another working group for this, which is every time somebody says, well, the protocol is not evil, the protocol is not a problem, it's the use of it, great, then we need to separate those two things. And I think we have dough for the protocol, we have that working group, we need another one for the, well, everything else. I'm sorry, but we had to close the lines be behind you. Hi, Mr. Bertola from Open Exchange and as DNS software implementers and recursive of operators, uh, I think that all the operational concerns that have been shown are, are pretty real. So please let, let's have a place where we can discuss them and see whether they need further protocol work or best practice or, or whatever. And especially please let, let's have a group in which we all meet because I, I feel that part of the problem in a way is that uh, I mean a part of the community was going in one direction and another part of the community was going in, in another direction. So now it's really time that we need, we need to agree on, on the way forward and find ways that are good for, for everyone. Thank you. Uh, from the user point of view, uh, that reminds me a lot. your name, please? Uh, Vasily Domatov. Uh, from the user point of view, it reminds me a lot of Shekhar's novel Watchbird. So we are trying to evade from some control on DNS service, and we are inventing another control point. And then we hand the control to the application developer or website owner, which is even not network operators. So I really doubt that it is a better choice for me as the user to handle the control to those groups. Moreover, I have heard here that they decided which list of DNS servers to use. Not me, not my network operator, but the application developers. So really, I can predict that uh, the wide implementation of this technology will lead to separation of the internet in the several application-centric universes. So they will, will be totally incompatible because different application developers will decide on different set of the servers. And they have quite a huge experience on tweaking the information and tracking the information of me as a user. 
Uh, really, I was very glad to see this discussion open, but I cannot imagine what deliverables could this working group make. Thank you. I timed that right. Uh, Eric Pascorla, a um, few, few points. Um, I think I, um, uh, as I said earlier, I think, you know, the, the, there is, um, I think, a wide divergence of opinions about what the um, appropriate place of the application is in this ecosystem. I don't see that gap closing. Um, ITF does not handle that kind of situation well. And the idea that, like, a working group will somehow resolve in some consensus statement about, like, the merits or demerits of an application or, or network control on the DNS, like, strikes me as extremely fanciful. Um, what will happen is we'll spend endless amounts of time negotiating in this bland possible text. That seems not, not useful. Um, as I said, there's useful work to do. Um, with that said, I wanted to make two substantive points. Um, the first is that um, we're talking about selection of, at most, we're talking about selection of defaults. Currently, the fault that everything has is whatever the network offered you. Um, and now we're talking about the application choosing a different default. Um, I can't speak for Chrome, but I can tell you that Firefox perfectly well allows you to enter any Dome resolver of your choice or turn off Dome. Um, and we'll continue to do so um, even if we pick it, even if we turn on on by default. So, um, so the user will have a, a perfectly, a, 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 their own choice. Um, we will have a set of people that we have verified comply with our policies, but that will not preclude the user from doing their own thing. Um, the second thing is I'm a little surprised to hear um, any of this characterized as like, as like the application's choice and not the user's choice. Like the user doesn't know what DNS is. The user has no idea the network is offering them a resolver. And the idea that the user like, like opted to like have like the IETF Wi-Fi, their DNS resolution in some like informed consent way. I mean, it's just not, does not track with what's actually going on here. So um, you may or may not think it's good for the application made the decision, the network made the decision, but the idea that like we're taking the choice out of the user's hands, I, I, I think a lot of trouble with that. So it seems clear that we need some more time. But it, so I think actually some progress was made, right? I think Lorenzo had a pretty interesting observation that some of these issues are not actually Doe dot related, but might actually be related to choosing non-traditional resolution points and, and maybe thinking through some of the points that were made today in during the talks along those lines might further tease them apart. And maybe we can sort of divide and conquer parts of the area a little bit better by trying to understand what actually causes the problems that people are seeing in operations, but also their shipping applications. Um, I don't know if Barry has any final thoughts for, as the area director that who's started this, or Barry has, oh, you're on the mic, excellent. I'm at the mic. Just just one thing, this is Barry. <clears throat> um, we, there was a lot of stuff presented today, a lot of stuff discussed at the microphones, but I don't want to try to tease any of that apart now. So the one simple question I just want to ask is, does anybody think that there's nothing that was discussed today that we should work on? If so, Come now, please. Okay, we do have a significant sense that we don't want to work on any of this. Uh, so we could take this back to the ADD. You should list ask the opposite question, though. This is, is I, whoever thinks that something here is worthy to be worked on further, please come now. Because well, otherwise, <laughs> okay. Uh, if, if you think there's something that that came up today that should be worked on, hum. Yeah. I mean, I, I heard that at the mic as well. I mean, we didn't really need it. So let's take this back to the ADD list and discuss. I would like the people who hummed saying there's nothing here that should be worked on to think about what you want to post to the list about why you don't think we should work on this, because I think that will be an interesting start to further discussion. And you can decide if you want to grant Lucy a minute. She's behind you. <laughs> Your show. Lucy Lynch. Um, that hum doesn't, doesn't work for me because the stuff I would like to work on is stuff that was said at mic, not in the presentations. I think there is a, a fundamental question here between should we do this and how do we do this? And how do we do this voices have been very loud in the room, but Yari, Leslie, DKG, several other people at the mic were the should we do this voices. And that's the IAB question, not the IESG question. Oh, okay. Yes, said, uh, last, uh, Barry, did you have one quick thing? When I said discussed today, I, I included what was discussed at the mic line, not just at what was discussed. In right, the so we'll pursue it on the ADD at IETF mailing list. Um, blue sheets, please, if you haven't signed it, do sign, and we'll meet them up front. And lastly, I just wanted to thank you all for a very respective, respectful conversation that we had today. So thank you.
go off. I have very strong opinions. Nice. 